If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater Ministries. I'm pleased to introduce to my audience a dear brother in the Lord, Richard Bennett, Director of Berean Beacon Ministries, an outreach to Roman Catholics. It is great to be here, Larry. For people that don't know you, you were a Roman Catholic priest for 22 years. Is that right? Please give us a short account of your life. Yes, I was a Catholic priest for 22 years. I was a Catholic altogether for 48 years, having grown up in Dublin, Ireland. I was trained uh, very early on in my education, in what we call secondary and elementary education, uh, by the Jesuits. And then I decided to become a Catholic priest, and I spent eight years uh, in preparation. It was a novitiate year, and then six years to ordination when I was ordained a priest in Dublin, Ireland in 1963, and then one year in Rome, eight years in all. Then I spent uh, 21 years in uh, Trinidad, West Indies, as a parish priest carrying out the, the work of a priest. I had the best academic training you could get finishing up in the city of Rome itself, near the Vatican, and I... I really had a desire to bring P Catholics to uh, what we thought was a way of being right with God so that they could get to purgatory and then that they finally could get to heaven. And I was great for doing penances and sacrifices. And then I was very devout in Trinidad, uh, uh, baptizing babies, hearing people's confessions and doing all the sacraments. It was in 1972, I had a very serious accident where I was three days unconscious after the serious accident. And then after that time, when I got out of the hospital in the sanatorium, I began searching in the Bible for what is true. It took me 14 years of comparing the Bible to Catholicism before I realized that I was dead in trespasses and sins and it was by grace alone that we are saved. I One night I got on the floor in my house and I cried out to God for faith and his grace to save a wretch like me, dead in trespass and sins, and he gloriously did that. It was about two months afterwards. I very reluctantly left the Catholic Church because my prayer after I was right with God by biblical salvation was that I could really love Catholics and give them the real true gospel of grace. That is grace alone, faith alone, and in Christ alone. But then in prayer over those two months after I was saved, the Lord showed me that I could best serve him and love Catholics if I left actually the priesthood and the Catholic Church and reached out to Catholics nonetheless. And um, I, I did that. I left uh, the priesthood in 1985 and uh, reached the States in 1986. And uh, I, um, I just prayed and prayed that I would have a love for Catholics to reach out. I thank the Lord that after one year as a missionary in China, I was able to start the ministry that I now have called BereanBeacon.org. It is to show Catholics the real truth of where salvation is in a person, not in any church. And it is by God's grace, not by any ritual that any church does. So this has been really wonderful. I've seen priests save. I saw two priests in Poland, you know, through our ministry. We have a Polish webpage. 
besides many other languages and of course in English and I thank God that I have seen God's grace poured out and that is my heart's desire Larry that Catholics would know the truth and that evangelicals in this very false ecumenical age would see the differences uh, I have a very interesting article on the web page uh, are Catholics Christians and we've had tremendous response to that evangelicals whose eyes have been opened in reading that article so it's with love for Catholics and to show the truth of Christ Jesus that God will be glorified and many many souls saved particularly Catholics to the glory of his name outstanding that was a wonderful testimony Richard uh, could you just real briefly tell us about the you've written some books and you've already mentioned your ministry but what are these books you've written and how can people find them yes i have written or edited uh, written some and edited others and uh, they have been amazing i just thank god uh, our most well-known book is far from rome near to god the testimonies of 50 converted catholic priests since 1994 that book has sold steadily across the world in english and in other languages and uh, it's on the third edition now and uh, the other book that has my heart really displayed and my love for catholics is the book i've written about catholicism called catholicism east of eden insights into catholicism for the 21st century this book is uh, published by Banner of True Trust, like the uh, book of the 50 testimonies of former priests. And um, I thank God for that because the Lord has used that book and it brought many Catholics to himself by that book. Uh, the other book that my heart was in, in editing, together with Mary Hertel, is a book called The Truth Set Us Free, 20 former nuns tell their stories and that book has been used mightily of the Lord as well and I thank God for the, those women most of whom are still alive and active in reaching out to Catholics themselves and it is just a wonderful testimony of God's grace and the the other book I've written is called On the Wings of Grace Alone I've edited that and that is just 30 ordinary Catholics and uh, what we call lay Catholics and how the Lord brought them to salvation. That is a, an amazing book too. How can you obtain these books? Well, go to our webpage, bereanbeacon.org and just go to the folder on the left-hand side, Books. And when you click on that, it gives all the details of how you can get those books. Outstanding. Well, Richard, uh, we're going to go into uh, showing people your videos now here across uh, particularly our audience on YouTube. But uh, many people don't know that you and me go to the same church here in Austin, Texas. So it gives me a special opportunity to be around you a lot just so we can do ministry work. But anyway, I want to thank you for allowing us to post your videos uh, on the Internet through YouTube and other Internet servers. You praise God and may souls be saved and the Lord glorified. Amen and amen. Amen. a very serious question because most people nowadays would say yes of course you know, it's one of the Christian churches but this question would never have been asked in most of the last 500 years since the Reformation it would never have been asked because people understood what biblical Christianity is people live biblical Christianity and they would say absolutely no that's why we had the Reformation that's why we believe by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone we believe that Christ died once and for all and that the head of the church is Jesus Christ and not a man in Rome saying he's in the but of course not but nowadays it's taken for granted that Catholics are Christian. And it has become 
such that it's not politically correct <laughs> to think otherwise. There has been a movement inside the Catholic Church since 1965. The Catholic Church started to use the word Christian about itself. It had Vatican II documents, and in these documents they again and again said that they were Christian. And then they produced the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and over a hundred times they say they're Christian. And then they wanted, as a Christian church, to reach out to other Christians, calling them separated brethren. And they made decisions that they were to be brought back into Mother Church. And then this was taken up by some leading evangelicals like J.I. Packer, John Stott in England, and then in the United States, so-called Christians like Chuck Colson and Richard John Newhouse took it up in Evangelicals and Catholics together in 1997. The second, the first was 1994, two, two statements that leading Evangelicals signed. Of course, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Not only are they Christians, but we are brothers and sisters with them as Christians. So the whole thing has become solidified and part of what is called Christianity, that we are brothers and sisters with Catholics. And so the whole thing has turned around so absolutely different than it has been in all these other centuries since the Reformation. Totally different. So it's something that we need to examine. We need to examine the differences. We have the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the official teaching of the Catholic Church, and we have the Bible, and we have to compare them and see, is this indeed Christian? This little tract that we have, Are You Right With God? is a way of reaching out to Catholics to show them in the Bible what the Word of God says on the principal topics that one should consider, like what is the Bible itself, what, what's the meaning of grace, what's the meaning of faith, what's the meaning of worshipping God, do we use at, at idols, do we use statues, and things like that. What? Who is God himself as, as God? What is his nature? These are things we have to examine, and I examine them in this, comparing official Catholic teaching in the Bible to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And we have to do this so that we can see the difference, and that's what's done in this tract. We also have it in an easier way in this chart. Thy word is truth, God's word is truth. And to have the topics down the center, it's the same as the tract, only it's easier to see in a presentation like this. And it's, it's a clear way to contrast what the Word of God actually says and what the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is. So we, we can compare precisely and in the light of the Word of God. Scripture says, thy word is light. God's word is light. It's clear to our mind what God says about these important topics. It's light. And then to see just what the Catholic Church says. Now, the important topic 
everybody realizes is what's the Bible itself? What is the Bible? What, what, is, it, is it an absolute in any way? Of course it is. Jesus said, thy word is truth. God's written word is truth. That's an absolute. Scripture cannot be broken, Jesus said. John 10.35. Scripture cannot be gainsaid. That is absolute. We have a yardstick, a measuring rod. Scripture cannot be broken, the Lord Jesus Christ said. Emphatically, God's word is truth. And the Apostle Paul said not to think beyond what is written. We do not go beyond what is written. And it's actually a commandment in Scripture. If we see in Proverbs, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We don't add one whittle. We don't add one thing to God's word. That's how pure the word of God is, not to add to it. Or as Jesus said to the Pharisees, because they added traditions, he said, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. You make the word of God to be nullified of no worth if you add your own traditions. That's how serious it is and what the Lord Jesus Christ says. What is the official teaching of the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church has its teaching in the Catechism of the Catholic Church and they make it so clear that they don't ever quote page numbers to give paragraph numbers, little sections. It's like verses in the Bible. You don't quote a chapter alone. You give the v verse. The Catholics give the precise section. And they deal with this beginning in section number 80, what they say about the Bible. Quotations, sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with another. Take up your Bible and look at it. Does it look like it's texting somebody else or it's, it's in communication? Is it in communication with anything else? It's the word of God once written. It's not communicating as the Catholics say it is. It, it's, it's written, it's, it's the word of God once delivered to the saints. And then they go on in paragraph 81 and holy tradition transmits in its authority the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit holy tradition what is that they don't tell you what tradition is it's something handed down but what 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 is it it transmits in the word of God this thing that you don't tell us what it is holy tradition or these doctrines, they transmit, they give forth the word of God. That is utter blasphemy. The scriptures tell you that it's the Holy Spirit. Move men so that they wrote, they wrote the things of God. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit applies the word to the soul. The Holy Spirit is the word that that, that the Lord God that uses and transmits the word spiritually to our hearts so that we see the truth and that we repent and that we trust in Christ alone. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us from beginning to end. He is the spirit of truth that transmits, has given us the word of God and not any so-called holy tradition. So you see how utterly different this is. And they give you the result of this um, way they look at the Bible in paragraph 82. 
As a result, the Church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. They don't go by Scripture alone. They tell you. Now, people study the cults, you know, when they're studying uh, at a you know, seminary or Bible school, and they, you know, the first mark of any cult is that it doesn't trust on the Scriptures alone. And even from that one quotation, you'd see that this is not a Christian church because it's, it's not trusting in the Word of God. That's the first sign that you don't have Christianity. You have a cult. You don't trust in the Word alone. But it actually gets worse as you continue to read the same paragraph. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. You are to love tradition, which they don't tell you what it is, equally as you love and respect the written word of God. Now, we honor the word of God because it gives us the mind of God. We think God's thoughts after him in propositional sentences. We have the very mind of God written out. So we respect the word of God with devotion but we do not show equal reverence to any other book or any other so-called tradition because of the level. This is at a real deep, high level. We respect the Word of God. It's like a, a woman and a man in marriage. The man says, I love and respect you to his wife. If he said... I love and respect you, honey, but I have equal love and reverence for my secretary. <laughs> what would you think of him? <laughs> Adulterer. You don't have equal love and reverence for any other woman. <laughs> and if a church, or so-called church, says I have equal love and reverence for tradition as I do sacred scripture say that's adulterous you, you can't you can't you can't and call yourself Christian you just cannot so you see how horrendous this is well how does the Catholic Church hold together since they don't have any absolutes ah they do have an absolute they have a man who's, who's infallible and so they go on to say in their catechism, paragraph 891, the Supreme Pontiff, in virtue of his office, possesses infallible teaching authority. When as Supreme Pastor and Teacher of all the faithful, he proclaims with a definitive act that a doctrine of faith and morals is to be held as such. So you have an infallible man with a big hat on his head, a mitre on his head, and, you know, and all the robes he sits in, on, and he... Um, he, he says it's true and he's infallible. So <laughs> you do what he says and that's how, that's your standard. That is man's standard. That's listening to man as if he were God, giving you an attribute of God which is blasphemous. There's nobody infallible. <laughs> Let God be true and every man a liar, as scripture says. <laughs> You don't base everything on a man. It's on the written word of God. And so even on this very first topic alone, you see that we're not dealing with a Christian church. We're dealing with a church that believes equally in tradition, which is her tradition, and she doesn't spell it out. And then she has a man controlling it. Break your heart think of at least what they claim over a, a billion people in this organization. I call it an organization or a system because not only not, but there's not a church, it's not a gathering of believers, a gathering of people who believe in a system. Break your heart. The most important topic after this is grace because it's dealing with who our God is our God is gracious for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
And so it follows on that, what we have here in the first verse, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. He's, it's the graciousness. By his grace, he is utterly gracious to reach out to those dead and trespass and sins as each one of us know that are saved. We were saved out of our sins. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. The gracious God not of anything that we deserve. We deserve only condemnation and death and damnation. It's by grace we are saved, through faith. And even the faith itself is a gift of God. This is so wonderful. Let us look at the official teaching of the Catholic Church. Grace is the help God gives us to respond to our vocation of becoming his adopted sons. It introduces us into the intimacy of the Trinitarian life. Paragraph 2021. 20, grace is a help. Man, how, how could you debase grace at that level? Grace is who God is. It's not simply a help. A help is something somebody uses. A man takes his black and decker power drill and he drills a hole in the wall and puts in the gadget he wants to whatever. A woman is cooking breakfast for her husband and she takes a frying pan, you know, it's a help, and she puts two or three eggs on it and cooks breakfast. God's grace is not something we use. It's, it's, it's something God does. It's who God is. It's his power in action. God so loved the world. It's not a help. The man, man responds to this. Man is in the driving seat. Man is not in the driving seat. It's God. God saves. I mean, talk about debasing in your official definition of grace what the graciousness of our God is. And then they go on in paragraph 11, 29, the church affirms for believers the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. What? Sacraments, rituals are necessary? What did, when, what, when the jailkeeper asked Paul and Silas, what do I do to be saved? <laughs> Paul and Silas didn't say, well, the sacraments are necessary. <laughs> to believe in the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. You know, it says, sacraments are necessary for salvation. Rituals are necessary for salvation. Oh, man. It goes on. Sacramental grace is the grace of the Holy Spirit given by Christ and proper to each sacrament. They say that the power that comes from these signs that you do to call sacrament rituals is God, the Holy Spirit power. That is an official blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So a priest in a little box, somebody comes and whispers their sins into his ears, you know, and then he says, I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I hate even to say those words. It's I said them for 21 years, the priest, oh man, you know. I have, and that people are forgiven their sins, you know, because that's Holy Spirit power. I baptize about 30 babies uh, every month as a priest, and I said there were new creatures that been, they're now are Christians and baptized because I had put water on the baby's head. It's blasphemous to say that, and it doesn't work. <laughs> you just look. I used to look at the babies I baptized and saw when they grew up, and said, man, it's like one of those microwaves that make noise and nothing happens. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was, uh, it was, you know, and those people I heard confessions of, you know, People were in adultery and fornication and drugs and everything. Then I saw they were, they were still continuing afterwards. It doesn't work. But then they say that's necessary for salvation. It's really horrendous, but that's the t official teaching of this 
system that calls itself church. Most important probably from our side is the faith that God gives us is faith. And this is so clear in scripture. We just praise God how clear he is and what faith is. Faith is a gift of God and comes through the word of God. The apostle Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. The object is believe is Jesus Christ. We believe on Jesus Christ, that's the object. Clear and clear. Simon Peter, as Peter said, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them who have obtained like precious faith with us. It comes from God. We obtain it from God. Clear in the written word of God what faith is. Summarized in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now these and other texts are so clear, you say, nobody could twist these. This is, you would think, impenetrable. No so-called church could ever twist this. Well, we look at what the Catholic Church says about faith. Paragraph 168. It is the church that believes first and so bears, nourishes, and sustains my faith. Church believes first, and so she sustains and nourishes your faith. Then the next paragraph, 169, salvation comes from God alone, but because we receive the life of faith through the church, she is our mother. Hmm. So you're believing in mother church then. And then they give a conclusion to this in paragraph one. 181. Believing is an ecclesial act. It's a church act. Believing is an ecclesial act. The church's faith precedes, engenders, supports, and nourishes our faith. The church is the mother of all believers. No one can have God as father who doesn't have the church as mother. You cannot believe unless the Catholic Church is your mother. You believe, first of all, in your mother. It is utterly, and that's where Catholics live. When I, in 1985, became a Bible believer, trust in Christ alone by his grace, and I phoned Ireland to tell them I had left the Catholic Church and the priesthood that I now trusted in Christ alone. They said, how could you leave Mother Church? That, that was the reply. We have Mother Church. We trust in Mother Church. It's not only official teaching, but that's how they live. They believe if Mother Church says it is so, it is so. If the ch and outside the Catholic Church, they say there's no salvation. And they try to bring people back into the Catholic Church. It, it, it's, it's something unless you see it in print and get a copy of the catechism and read it, you say, this, there's no cult could ever say things to get people to believe in the cult as clearly as this. And they have been successful in this. This is where it breaks your heart. When I'm at the supermarket and I say to the checkout gal, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, have you read your Bible today? She said, no, but I go to church. And I say, you go to Catholic church? And say, yes. And I said, well then, uh, how can we be saved and be right with God? I said, well, I go to church. I said, there's no system where church saves. <laughs> it's a person. <laughs> Jesus Christ saves, and it's, it's God sent his only begotten Son that we would believe on him. And I've seen, even at the checkout counters at Winn-Dixie, they call them here, but we call them, uh, we have different names up in Texas, but it's, when I've seen at the checkout, people's lives turned around just by saying, there's no church saved, we, we don't believe in any Belief in a church does not save. It is amazing. 
we've got to take this teaching and apply it in our lives so when we witness we know what the Catholic mindset is and then we get them to believe on a person and that and then leave the fruit to God to save to the uttermost by his grace. It is uh, really, really, really difficult. So we come down to the one mediator. <coughs> Salvation is by one person, Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Neither salvation nor any other, for there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. We know the scriptures. What does the Catholic Church say? Paragraph 969. Taken up to heaven, she, that is Mary, did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Mary continues to bring the gift of salvation, so they say. And then, therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the Church under the titles of Advocate, Helper, Benefactress, and Mediatrix. We have a feminine mediator. Masculine one is Jesus, mediator, and then mediatrix, the feminine form of mediator, is Mary. So it's not one, it's two. <laughs> and according to them. And she is also a mediatrix. And quite blasphemous, they say she's the advocate and the helper and the benefactress. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, was another advocate. The divine Holy Spirit. He is our benefactor. And he is the one who ministers to us and not a human creature who is called the Advocate and the Helper. Christ Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit he would to help us in all things, and to lead us into the truth. It's, it, 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 it's really hard. It's, it's hard for me sometimes even to read these things. It's, it's so blasphemous. <coughs> and then we come to the idolatry issue. I think we all know the the Ten Commandments and that we're not to have a grave, an image, and we're not to show reverence and worship to it. We see what the Catholic Church says. They number the commandments differently and they put the first and the second together and they call it the first commandment. But it's worded the same way as we worded, you know, not to have any graven image. So let us read what they say. Paragraph 2132. The Christian veneration of images is not contrary to the first commandment which prescribes idols. Indeed, the honor rendered to an image passes to its prototype. Whoever venerates an image venerates the person portrayed in it. So they say it's not against this commandment not to have, gra to have graven images, because if you venerate the image, if you honor and reverence the image, you go through the image to the prototype, to God himself. You see, you go through it. If you go to Exodus 32, Aaron had the same idea. He said, let us have a feast to the God of Israel. They wanted to, they wanted, he wanted to worship the God of Israel. Moses was gone for a long time and he wanted to worship the God of Israel. So they had a way, they got the earrings and everything, they made a molten calf. And so they were worshiping the God of Israel through the calf. You know, just going to God through an idol, through an image. And God hates idolatry. And the Catholic Church says, it's because we're going to go through the, <laughs> the image. It's the exact what God hates and forbids is the way you say it's justified. And... Uh, the scripture is so clear, if we look on the other side of the page, Deuteronomy 4, 13 to 16, he declared unto you his covenant, he commanded to you beforehand the Ten Commandments and wrote them on two tablets of stone. Take ye therefore heed unto yourself, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day the Lord appeared, lest ye corrupt yourself 
and make a graven image, the similitude, it's the similitude, it's the likeness of God that's forbidden. God is not against art and beautiful, you know, designs and things, but it's the art of God. We do not make pictures or, or photographs or drawings of Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. And that's the way the early church saw it until the 8th century, where there was the, the whole controversy for that whole century about icons and images. And at the time of the Reformation, with the exception of some of the Presbyterians, uh, all the Reformed people at the time of the Reformation hated idols and images of Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because the scripture forbids it. But the Catholic Church says it is all right. And this is where many, many churches have been devastated. And I wish I have four articles about this on a web page, and I've made some videos about it. And my heart really grieves about this. This is where the Catholic teaching has come into so many Bible-believing churches. It's, it's really, really, really sad. At the time when the Passion of Christ came out, the Mel Gibson's <coughs> film, and now in DVD format, uh, about the Passion of Christ, where you could see Christ on the cross and see his sufferings and everything. And all that is idolatry, showing in moving form. You don't have Christ on the cross of suffering here as a statue in front of your church, but you show the video. So many churches closed down on the Sunday when that came out and went to see the passion of Christ. And then they have the Jesus film from Campus Crusade, and it's used in evangelism, idolatry used in evangelism, where Christ is looking at you at the, at the end to make a decision. It's a false gospel message added to the idolatry at the end. It's horrendous. Children's Bibles in churches, and you go to the Sunday school and they're painting pictures of Jesus like the Catholics do and flannographs just the same as the Catholics do. It's, it's, like, it's like we are no different than the Catholics when it comes to idolatry. No differentiation whatsoever. It really breaks your heart to see how the Catholics have been successful. If you get people to break one of the commandments of God, it's downhill from then, you know, and it's, it's like if you have the wrong worship in, in your church and you get into the worldly ways, it's downhill. If you get into idolatry, it's downhill. You're breaking God's word. But that is really, really, really sad to give an historical reason to it. Going back to that council, just horrendous. And then the, we finish on this, God the All-Holy One. That's the very top of the page there. God is the All-Holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. There is none like unto thee. It is, he is glorious in holiness. There is, who shall not fear thee or, or glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. God is infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, and power, the attributes of God, but the most important is the de delineating, the definitive way that God is differentiated from all his creatures, is that he is holy, he is separate from all evil, utterly perfect in every aspect of his being, and so he's totally holy. This is who God is. This is why we worship him. This is why we must be saved before the all-holy God. There is none holy as the Lord. What does the Catholic Church say? Paragraph 2677. By asking Mary to pray for us, we acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners. We address ourselves as the mother of mercy, the all-holy one. 
Mary is called the Hall of Holy One. It's in capital letters. That is utterly blasphemous. There is no other system that has ever blasphemed God officially than the Catholic Church has. And they go on to say that she's the source of holiness. Utterly blasphemous. Now our hearts go out to Catholics. I, I remember at the end of my 48 years as a Catholic, when I saw that this was utterly, totally against God, I was in a terrible state, you know what I mean? I was in, in a terrible state, and I was wondering just what do I do, you know what I mean? And it was, uh, I, I, I really saw that this is just deadness. I saw that Christ said to the Pharisees who denied him and had other teachings, you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. And I literally got on my knees before God and prayed that he would show me that I really was dead and that he would give me the gift of faith because I could do nothing and that he would give me the grace. And after about four or five minutes, I started to pray, Father in heaven, I trust in Christ and Christ alone. I accept being right in him in whom is all righteousness through his suffering and death on the cross. Give me peace with you and life in the Holy Spirit. I had everlasting life as I trusted on him alone. And that's what I say to devout Catholics listening. Trust on Christ alone. See that you're dead in sin. There's no church saves. And know this is everlasting life in him. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the